It's time to accelerate. Hey, friends, this is Andy. Welcome to episode 646 of Accelerate, the sales podcast of record. I am honored to be joined on the show today by my guest, Goddard Abel. Goddard is a very successful serial entrepreneur and currently co founder and CEO of G2 Crowd. And today we're going to talk about Goddard's story as an entrepreneur growing multiple successful startups. We're also going to dig into how Goddard establishes authentic connections with other people. You know, people may claim that no one talks on the phone, but Goddard shares his view of why the phone is really his best tool, if not the best tool, for having the quality conversations that lead to developing the quality relationships that you need in your business, whether it's you know, sales or any other sort of strategic relationship that you are developing. And based on his experiences, he has some great advice for startups and small businesses looking to sell into the enterprise. So make sure you stick around and check that out. If you'd like to see show notes for this episode, go to andypaul.com forward slash 646. As always, we provide a breakdown of this and all conversations on Accelerate. Make sure you can check out that at andypaul.com forward slash 643. Now, friends, let me say that I often hear from listeners who are looking for a new sales challenge. And I tell them that one of the most important elements to career success is making sure to align yourself with the right company, one that develops its employees, values their customers, and has a portfolio of category-leading products that can compete with anyone in the market. And with its recent acquisition of Level 3, the new CenturyLink has become a world leader in providing those types of services, cloud security, real-time communications, and managed services. So if you're a top sales producer and you're looking to challenge yourself in order to take your career to the next level, then visit CenturyLink.com forward slash accelerate. Join their talent community. See if CenturyLink is the right step for you and your career. And lastly, before I talk with Goddard, let me share with you that the second edition of the Sales Leadership Accelerated Mastermind for sales, SaaS sales leaders kicks off on April 24th. This is an event that I partner with uh, Jocko Vanderkoy, founder of Winning by Design, to put on. We call it SaaS Slam for short. And SaaS Slam is limited. Participation in SaaS Slam is limited to founder CEOs, CROs and VPs of sales of high-growth SaaS startups only. And we call it Accelerated Mastermind because in just two days, you're going to become better prepared to transform how you sell, how you scale, and how you develop the capabilities of your team to crush your goals. So for more information and to apply for your place at SaaS Slam, go to www.saasslam.com forward slash Event one, the number one, that's www.sasslam.com forward slash event one. All right, let's get to it with Goddard. Goddard, welcome to Accelerate. Thanks, Andy. So a question for you, I ask Santa question, I ask all my guests at the start of the show, and that is, in your opinion, what's, what's the single biggest challenge facing sales reps today? I think it's breaking through the noise. And there are just so many technologies and vendors out there. And I used to work at Salesforce. And for example, on the Epic Exchange now, I think there's about 5,000 products. Right. So 5,000 different sales technologies being pitched to Salesforce and CRM customers every day. And breaking through that noise is pretty daunting. So what's the recommendations for how you do that? I think what works best is true personalization. And like a lot of executives, you know, I probably every day get hundreds of pings old emails or sales reps trying to get my attention. And I think most of them are not personalized. And I think that's a downside. And there are great tools out there, you know, things like SalesLoft or Salesforce where people have templates and they're just pinging hundreds of people at once. But I think it tends to just get deleted. You know, whereas the people that really personalize their message have, you know, a personal connection, have someone that I know via LinkedIn connect me or really think about something they've seen about G2 Crowd and, and truly put it in my context, how their solution can add value for me. I think those are the messages that stand, stand out. But I'm actually amazed at how few you know, salespeople do that, that you know, take the time to truly personalize the message. Well, I mean, one of the things that those platforms talk about is this idea of, which I don't believe in personally, is mass personalization at scale. <laughs> and it's yeah. like, I don't think that exists, right? I agree. I think it's, I think you can actually feel it. I mean, it's somewhat spiritual. You know, if you're authentically actually thinking about the other person and connecting to them, even when you don't know them yet, it comes through in what you write 
what your message is or and the other thing I actually I often say people I was at Salesforce after my steel brick was acquired by Salesforce mm-hmm. and I did an internal training for a bunch of their sales executives at Salesforce and one of the things I said to them is hey pick up the phone because one thing I've noticed you know since I started working 20 years ago frankly my phone rings less and less and everyone is trying to do this digital hyper personalized but I actually rarely get a phone call and and I would say the same thing, right? If you call me, A, I'm likely to answer. And then B, you have to be prepared to have a very, you know, authentic, personalized conversation. And uh, but but I also see very few people doing that. Yeah, I, I I use the term when it comes to emails is you have to humanize them and distinguish because everybody's taken personalization really to mean it's like, hey, let's just slap somebody's first name in a mail merge and that's personalization. Uh, but you have to show something deeper than that something that truly is personal and and shows a little bit of uh shows a little bit of your humanity as you talk in an authentic way yes and then i think we can all feel it you know we can all feel authenticity and i have three kids and kids are amazing at this but then i think somehow we we lose it as we as we get older well interesting what you said about the phone too because I think that's become this group think the accepted thing as well. Hey, I can never reach anybody on the phone. It's become so hard. And you're talking about, you know, CEO of now multiple companies uh, is yeah. Phone's a good way to reach me if you're prepared. Right. And frankly, it rings less and less over the years. You know, Cause even then internally we use Slack, right. We use email, right. But I do think that the fault for the younger generation is more digital and yes, in theory, it's more efficient. But I also find, you know, myself, if when I'm selling or I'm trying to negotiate, I always, once it gets real, I, I always prefer to do it by voice and actually minimize any written because I, you know, I think to really build a relationship, come to an agreement with another human being, there's nothing like talking to them. Well, and so let's dig into that for a second, because that is sort of certainly the trend in sales these days with, you know, SDRs and certainly at least in the tech space, but it's going in other spaces as well, is is more sort of this mass approach, less personalized, where it seems we're setting people up where it's, we sort of set up in such a way it's hard to build those relationships. I mean, because, hey, we have an SDR. My job is just to pass you on to somebody else. Right. Now, I think we're choosing in general as an industry, we're choosing quantity over quality. And then I do think that's a big opportunity to do quality. And even when I think about it, you know, like most people, I feel rushed a lot of days. And I do actually do a lot of what I will call random networking. Mm-hmm. Like last week, I was at Saster right. and I meet a lot of entrepreneurs and but I actually really enjoy it. And then sometimes it's hard to justify because like everyone else, my inbox is overflowing and I have 100 things I feel like are creating anxiety for me and I should be responding to. <laughs> but then you know, on the flip side, if I really have, you know, every day, let's just say I have two authentic coffee lunch meetings with another human being and I spend an hour genuinely authentically interacting with them now I've got you know a relationship for life and and it's also I think the joy of my work is getting to know people Mm -hmm. and but it's also highly effective and if you do it for many years now I've been doing it for 20 years in this industry then all of a sudden you know when I go to an event like Sastra or like Dreamforce you know I feel like it's it's like a college reunion where I'm meeting you know kind of hundreds of old friends and uh, which I think makes my work enjoyable but it also becomes very effective because now you know my sales team almost any account they want to get into a G2 crowd I tend to genuinely know someone and you know and then because we do know each other because we do have a trusted relationship you know it's much easier I can do that very personalized outreach right and, you know, then we can get in front of them. And, and if we, if our solution, G2 Crowd, has a lot of value for them, they're much more likely to engage with us. So for listeners who maybe know the name G2 Crowd but aren't familiar with what it does, you know, tell the, tell the audience what, what G2 Crowd does. Yeah, and G2 Crowd, we're a review platform for business technology, so for all types of enterprise software and services. And we really started the company because we wanted to create something to scratch our own itch. And I'd always been an enterprise software entrepreneur. So my first company, Big Machines, which is not part of Oracle, but we were building CPQ software. And one of my big challenges as an entrepreneur at the beginning was how do I get third party validation? Mm-hmm. We thought we had a great product and you know we had a great vision, but really you know, at the beginning, the problem you have when you're a startup, really no one gives a shit. Right. You know, and that's kind of that noise thing I talked about. There's thousands of companies being started every day and why should they care about you? So we were desperate for third party validation. And, you know, back in the early 2000s, really the only thing that was out there were analysts like Gartner and Forrester. 
that would give you that third party validation. But you know, I remember with big machines, it took me nine years just to get in the Gartner report. And, you know, and eventually I think after 12 years, they called us a leader, but I was always frustrated. It seemed to be a very lagging indicator and, you know, in our consumer lives in the meantime, when we started G2 crowd in 2012, you know, really personally, I was buying everything on Amazon and I would always use the reviews to help me make a quick buying decision. And there were also tools like Yelp or in our world glass store, you know, mm -hmm. they had a vision it would be amazing if our customers had the same kind of resource. And when they were looking to buy our software, if they could read real peer reviews. And we looked around in 2012, we didn't think there was any website out there doing a good job of that. And so we really wanted to bring that consumer review, that peer advice model to our industry. And, but I think one of the things we decided to do differently was to make it all based on real people. So we used LinkedIn identity from the beginning and LinkedIn, you know, we knew in our industry, it really is becoming everyone's professional identity. So it can be right. trusted. Right. You can see if real people, you can see if you're connected to them. And we thought that knowing who wrote the review is really the thing that was going to make you trust it. And today on G2 Crowd, we have features. You can filter reviews by your first degree LinkedIn connections. So you can actually find people you know, trusted peers in the industry who use these products, see what they wrote about them. And that we think is really what gives you that trust and comfort and allows you to make technology buying decisions much more quickly. And the other good we think it does for the industry, it gives the customers a bigger voice because I as an entrepreneur then... You know, I no longer have to talk to analysts. I can just make sure my customers are happy. I can take their feedback to heart. And there's amazing entrepreneurs now like Eric Wan from Zoom, for example. He's the founder and CEO of right. Zoom. And Zoom has been, and we use their tool. His slogan is delivering happiness. And I think for most of us, web meetings have been anything but happy. Right. And I think we've all experienced waiting five or ten minutes. Oh, can I get on? How to get the monitor turned on? Audio is not working. And really what Eric and Zoom have done, they've taken away all that pain. And now, you know, typically with one click, you're in your meeting. And, and he also does a lot of work to make sure the voice and the video quality that Zoom delivers are truly the best in the industry. But, but, you know, but he also loves a platform like G2 Crowd because he's encouraged his customers when they log out of meetings to write reviews. He has well over 2,000 reviews now. And he has the highest satisfaction rating based on those G2 Crowd user reviews. And now it's part of also their message to the market is, hey, you know, we do truly deliver happiness, but don't believe me. You know, look, thousands of customers have validated my success and happiness. And, um, and so I think that's what really makes me excited is that we are allowing, you know, entrepreneurs like Eric and emerging technologies like Zoom that truly deliver best, better customer experiences. We're allowing them to win faster in the marketplace and really helping buyers, you know, figure out, hey, which, which of these. And in web conferencing, for example, there are hundreds of different technologies. So as a buyer, it's kind of daunting, you know, which one right. do I pick? But now G2 Crowd just makes it much easier to, you know, kind of quickly, based on peer reviews, find the right technology. Right. So if you're looking for information about a product or service, then the service is free, but then the vendors pay to get listed. Actually, it's a freemium model because okay. yeah, I, like I said, I've always been that bootstrap entrepreneur. Sure. So I, and I didn't want it to cost any money. I wanted it to be real time. So you can start for free and there's actually a link on the bottom of the GT crowd website. So if you're an entrepreneur starting out, you can list your product. As soon as you have some customers, you might as well list it for free. You can encourage your customers to write some authentic reviews. And again, none of that costs you money. You can get into our ratings. We call them grids. And it's a real-time version of something like a Magic Quadrant, except it's all crowdsourced data. And so you can get validation, third-party validation for free. And, um, and then, you know, there is a way that we do offer what we call marketing solutions. So if you do want to upgrade it, and that's a bit like Glassdoor's model, you know, where you're listed companies are just listed there it doesn't cost you anything and you get reviews from your employees but then if you want to engage all the prospective employees then you know you can pay glassdoor for advertising etc mm -hmm. g2 crowd is somewhat similar where we offer premium listings where you can then embed your own demo videos your own marketing content so you can engage some of those buyers straight from g2 crowd and i think even more interesting part of our marketing solution are analytics. So then we can also show you, you know, how's your profile doing, which buyers, which companies are investigating your product, who are they comparing you to? And that's really all part of this trend of account-based marketing, where you do get digital signals then from G2 Crowd, hey, these companies in your target account list, you know, today they just spent two hours reading your reviews. They're compare, comparing you to your competitor. And knowing that in real time is very valuable to a marketer. And to the salesperson, because, you know, now is probably a good time to pick up the phone and call that account because they're, you know, now they're in an active buying cycle. So 
what's the vision beyond software? I mean, I know there's some service providers that are on there now. What do you see as sort of the, the larger vision for, for G2 Crowd? And we do want to stay focused on, you know, what I would call business technology and related services because it's just such a huge world. And uh, we really just want to provide the best peer reviews and advice in that industry. And and to quote Gartner, maybe somewhat ironically, but I think they say it's about it's a four trillion dollar industry, you know, business technology and it's growing. And frankly, even Gartner is doing quite well. I think they have like a 13 billion dollar market cap. They're growing. Right. And right. I think it's just a result and everyone says it now. I think I love Mark Andreessen's quote, you know, software's eating the, the world. world right? And I think for any business now, digital transformation is so imperative. Even if you're running a restaurant, right, and you don't have the right technology, you don't use Yelp and OpenTable the right way, it really jeopardizes your existence. And that's true in every industry. And so we also think, you know, as an entrepreneur, as a business builder, I want, you know, my brethren across industries to have great technology advice because it is truly mission critical. And so we think there's you know, more than enough to do. And we did also raise a bunch of capital last year, Excel, a leading VC firm that also invested in Facebook and Slack, et cetera. You know, they, they invested, you know, over $20 million in our company as, and LinkedIn also invested as part of the product partnership. And I mentioned earlier, the LinkedIn identity is so crucial to creating trust in our reviews. So it kind of grew out of that partnership. Uh, but that does, you know, so I think also these investors are betting yet yeah, this is a massive industry. And if we can really be the best source of genuine peer reviews, peer advice, and influence $4 trillion of spend, then we can also build a nice business. Yeah, and I think that, that and not to throw shade on Gartner, but I, mean, I sense there's always some a little bit of skepticism about some of the magic quadrant research because you know, people pay Gartner, those same companies are paying Gartner a fair amount of money. And I don't know if yeah. you know, they're concerned about the objectivity, I guess. And then if you have a purely a peer review system, then... You don't have those concerns. Yeah. No, and I, I certainly experienced that. You know, I remember at Big Machines at the end, you know, we were spending seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year, you know, to get access to the analysts. And right. uh, but you know, but then the other problem, even if the analyst is totally unbiased, they can only cover so many companies because it's a human model. You mm-hmm. know, and they always put some criteria on it. I remember in CPQ you had to have at least twenty million in revenue and they'll only cover, let's say, ten vendors. And it's just because if you're a human being doing the research, kind of primary research, maybe you can only talk to so many vendors. Whereas, you know, the beauty of the crowdsource model, like you look at our CRM category on G2 Crowd, we have hundreds of products. And again, it's freemium. So, you know, a lot of them are small entrepreneurs just starting for free. But as soon as they have 10 customer reviews, they're included in our ratings, you know, for free. And it's real time. As soon as you get that 10th review, you're in our ratings, you're in the game. And, um, and so I think that's the biggest thing. I think it's just a modern real-time model. And really, if you look at all kinds of online publishing, you know, really it, almost every sector has gone to this model, right? And I think that the notion of kind of this legacy publishing model of an expert doing primary research and publishing a report every two or three years, it's just not, you know, it's, it can't keep up with the real-time nature of enterprise technology. And as you know, I think, you know, marketing technology, for example, there's a MarTech 5000, and every day there's new vendors, new technologies, right. new things popping right. up. And so we just think, you know, really the crowdsourced model is really the only way to keep up with that and, and actually make sure the buyers have access to all the products, all the technologies, and have, have access to them in real time. You know, they don't have to wait multiple years until an analyst starts uh, covering them. Yeah, well, very interesting. Yeah, I mean, for listeners, you know, if you're considering purchases and you're not, you know, business technology, you're not looking at uh, G2 Crowd, you you should. I mean, it's, I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I like just going in. That's when every time I hear about a new company, the first place I go to look at it and investigate, actually, is G2 Crowd. No, thanks for doing that. And it yeah. is free. I mean, it's a beauty of it for the buyer. Yeah. You can get insights, you know, for free. And uh, we do hope more and more buyers discover it. And frankly, Andy, if you see a vendor that's not on there yet, like I said, you can send them a note suggesting a list of product. They can get started for free. Or I'm always happy to help them as well. You know, and we do want them all to get started. And, and like I said, we don't care. And the number one rated product on our G2 Crowd platform right now is Slack. And frankly, Slack has never spent a penny with us. Mm-hmm. You know, but we just put out our top 100 rating. They were number one. And it's because in Slack, it's not a secret anymore, right? But they also, on our platform, they have over 10,000 great customer reviews and users tend to just love their app. Right. And those are the kinds of vendors we're going to highlight, you know, whether whether they spend money with us or not. Okay. Well, another topic I want to talk to you about today is, you know, given your experience building, you know, three companies now, and certainly one of them, big machines uh, we talked about before, is, was targeted at the enterprises. You know, a lot of 
listeners and the audience are at, you know, small, mid-sized enterprises looking at going up market with the products they sell, selling to the, you know, somewhat of a complex solution to the enterprises. Yeah, I'm sure they appreciate learning more about how you sort of organized a new company from the beginning to do that. Because oftentimes they sort of think, well, we need to grow before we can tackle selling to the large enterprise. And I know I work for a number of startups where, yeah, we started off selling to the large enterprise. Just interesting how you sort of organized yourself to, from the beginning to go out and sell to larger enterprise. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, big machines, and it was a long learning process. And I think also what I would caution everyone, and I think what, what you know, Andy, from selling the enterprise, it does take a long time. You know, and yeah. I think that's the, the biggest challenge for a startup. You know, oftentimes, even if you do everything perfectly, it might be a two-year sales cycle, you know, until you get an account like a GE or an IBM. And then I think it took me a few years to kind of figure out why. And it's really not even about, I think you can pretty quickly get someone, let's say, at IBM or GE excited about your product, but then all the internal, you know, consensus they have to build with IT, with legal, with security, with budgeting process, you know, until they can actually make the purchase and get your product deployed. It just takes, you know, at a minimum, I think it takes, you know, many months and worst case, it takes many years. So I think as a startup, you know, you have to choose it at the right time. Uh, either you have to have the funding, you know, you can, you can live through that, you know, or I think what, you know, what we certainly did at G2 Crowd or even my last company, Steelbrick, that's not part of Salesforce. You know, at Steelbrick, for example, we did start out selling more mid-market, but then we, and what I've learned is you really need different teams to sell to them because I think an enterprise sales rep, <clears throat> it's a different cadence and probably a different person. They do need to be more experienced and I think, uh, and probably be a little bit older because to have that comfort to have conversations with executives at companies like IBM and GE, mm-hmm. you just need some gravitas that frankly, I think you're just not going to have straight out of, straight out of college. And, um, and I think it's also, you have to have different quotas even and different expectations. And at G2 crowd now, for example, we do have a, we have an SMB or called a growth sales team that targets em- companies with employees of one to 50. And obviously they can typically, they're talking to an entrepreneur who can make a decision in one call. You know, so it's just a quick inside sale, give me some more information. And if I like it, I'll buy. And then the opposite end now we have an enterprise sales team and that starts for us at a thousand employees. And they really, you know, there we also know when we hire a new enterprise rep, Hey, for the first two quarters, they're probably not going to sell much of anything. And it's really only going to be by their fourth quarter where they're productive. And so we give them the time and their job is really much different. And, you know, and we are proud at G2 Crowd. For example, IBM did just become a significant customer. But, you know, but the sales rep working at Alex, I mean, he spent a couple of years building the relationship, getting to know all the people at IBM and aligning with their plans and budgets for the next year. And so it's it's really it's just a very different process. And I saw the same thing at Salesforce and Salesforce now. While I was there, you know, they segment their sales teams in about 10 different layers, you know, going all the way from uh, SSMB, which is, you know, companies one to 10 employees right. going all the way to their truly fortune 500 true enterprise. And, and I think, so I think if you have one, if you have the same salesperson trying to do both, the odds are they're going to fail, you know, because I think to be good at the SMB sales, you have to be very transactional. You have to be on the phone, making hundreds of phone calls, trying to close every call. And in the enterprise, it's kind of the opposite where if you try to close them on the first call, you know, they're probably going to laugh at you. And, uh, so you have to be prepared to, to build those relationships. And, but it's, it's, I think you have to have two different jobs and two different teams. And, and as a startup, as an entrepreneur, obviously you have to have the financial strength, you know, and be able to survive those long enterprise sales cycles before you, you start going after them. Yeah. Long sales cycles and also sort of greater uncertainty about whether, you know, win or not. It tends to be a little more binary, I guess, as you know, big True. deals. Um, so they're hard to forecast, right? You never know like any one deal. And then the only way around that, you need a large portfolio of enterprise deals, right? So you need a team doing them, but, but yeah, but they're, uh, yeah, you're not going like to, they're, they're more uncertain. Yeah. You're not going to have five X pipeline coverage on really large deals. Um, yeah. uh, not, not like you want a more transactional business. Um, the interesting thing about hiring different people. So, I mean, I think this is the thing that's really hard for, for entrepreneurs, not necessarily in startup, but again, in let's say a, $5 million company been in business for five, 10 years looking to, to step up is, yeah, it's, it's hard for the CEO to say, yeah, I'm going to invest in somebody who's going to take six months to a year or two years to really become productive because they see that money coming right out of their pocket. Uh, what sort of advice could you give them about making that investment, being patient? Yeah, I know it's hard. And frankly, what's also hard is to find an enterprise sales executive that can succeed 
with that entrepreneur, you had a five million dollar company. Mm. So oftentimes, and I had this experience at big machines. You know, the first, frankly, three heads of sales I tried to hire were not successful, and and a lot of that was also on me. Frankly, I think I hired them too early. You know, before we truly right. had product market fit, but right. you know, but I hired people that came from big companies, and then I think what's also hard. Let's say you hire somebody from Oracle or from Salesforce. And one thing they tend to also not recognize is how much the brand that's behind them and the the strength of the resources of a company like that helps them sell to an enterprise. So all of a sudden, in Matt Gorniak, you know, my head of sales at Big Machines and Steelbrick, what he always said, you know, I think the challenge with your startup is, you know, you call them, you're like, hi, hey, it's Matt from Steelbrick. And they're like, who? Who are you? Steel what? You know? And uh, so the the amount of work you have to do to build credibility, build relationships is, you know, probably five or 10 times greater than if you call him, Hey, this is Matt from Salesforce. Mm-hmm. And he still tells Salesforce what he can do today. Right away. They're like, Oh, I've heard of you. You know, Mark Benioff's brilliant and they'll engage with you right away. This stuff along sales cycle. So I think finding someone that does have an experience that has a gravitas, but they can operate in a startup environment. So I think you really also have to have people that love being the underdog and probably the ideal hire has seen that before, you know, they've been part of a large enterprise, but they've also been at a startup. So they have a recognition for how much harder it's going to be uh, in a startup. But some people love it, you know, and they, they love being the underdog and, and kind of yeah. being that, you know, kind of the, the, the scrappy underdog. And I, I love that as an entrepreneur. Otherwise, why start a company? Right. Because at the beginning, you are a massive underdog. And but some people feed on that. And I think finding enterprise sales executives that feed on that energy that love being the underdog that want to be that breakthrough, you know, to be the guy in the company that does a first million dollar deal. Um, but, but you have to find people that have that energy and I think it does require a higher level of energy and commitment and, you know, and that they do love being the underdog and they want to make the, the breakthrough. And, uh, it's just, I think it is just even much harder than when you're selling for an established brand. Yeah. I think another mistake that I've seen that the entrepreneurs make is, in that first hire, in place of the energy, they think they can hire the Rolodex. If people right. understand the Rolodex, the list of contacts. And yeah, I've rarely ever seen that work out. True. And, and I think the reality of that is, let's say, you know, and I worked at Salesforce or my first company got bought by Oracle. But the reality is, you know, the Oracle customer, they're not buying really from that sales rep, right? They're buying the Oracle brand. And so, you know, just because that salesperson sold someone while they were at Oracle doesn't mean that that customer is going to buy from that individual again. Right. And uh, so I, I do think kind of in some ways the Rolodex is dead, you know, or just having a list of contacts because we can all get that now with LinkedIn. Right. It's right. easy to figure out who to call. Yep. Um, the hard part is breaking through that noise because that person is getting hundreds of pings. So how do we you know, how do you break through that? All right. You started big machines back in roughly 2000. And yes. and we're growing that. So what is what you've seen as sort of the differences between growing big machines sort of fifteen years ago versus growing G two crowd now? Well, I do think. I mean, all in all, I do think it's easier now. I mean, I think all the technology and and there are these big drivers. You know, certainly right now, the cloud is a massive mm-hmm. driver where all enterprises are trying to go to the cloud, and and frankly, also there's a massive arms race between Amazon and AWS and Google's cloud and Microsoft Azure and now Oracle trying to get in the game. So there are, there are just these greater trends of companies wanting to and needing to buy technology. And so I think all in all, there's just more momentum for our whole industry. And, uh, you know, and I think on the flip side, like I said, I think what is harder, there are just thousands more companies out there selling SaaS products, cloud products. So, you know, breaking through that noise, is I think harder for most, but I think we're now also benefiting doing it the third time and having credibility with investors and employees and customers. I think we do have the ability to break through that noise and, uh, and there are all these great technologies and we do really try to you know, be best practice users ourselves. Obviously we use Salesforce for our CRM. We use Intact, which is not part of Sage for our financials, but we also use you know, probably 20 or 30 different sales and marketing applications mm-hmm. to make make our sales and marketing process easier and better. And, and I, I do think by taking advantage of those technologies, it's much easier to scale. You know, I think we're scaling our sales team probably a year ago. Maybe we had, you know, 10 sellers. I think, you know, soon we'll have 40 quota carriers. Right. And, and I think using these technologies, we can get them to be more productive more quickly. And of course, so what I mentioned at the beginning, it's also important. We don't just get reliant on the digital technology and we still build the, 
authentic human relationships with our customers. But but all in all, I think if you use the technologies in the right smart way and the overall m- momentum of our industry moving towards the cloud and people now doing AI and mobile technologies and, and businesses are just so hungry for technologies to help them get better in their own business. So I think, you know, in that sense, it's a, it is a good environment to, uh, to be selling in. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, I look at some of these tools and think back to when I was first time in my career and bag carrying salesperson that, um, yeah, I could have really used some, <laughs> you could have used some of those things. Yeah, it would have made a, yeah. a huge difference, especially working some of the large accounts and, Anyway, yeah. All right. So I remember you probably remember the same thing back in 2000. Right? Just figuring out who to call was really hard. Well, I tell you know? people yeah. now you go to LinkedIn and you can find just about anybody within a few seconds. Yeah, I was telling somebody yesterday. I, back in the late 80s, when I just started doing uh, inter- large-scale international sales with you know, multi-million-dollar communication systems, working for a startup, I was, I was cold calling companies in Europe and Asia. I mean, there was no. No, no internet, you know, how do you find a, a point of contact? Right. Yeah. And then back then the Rolodex did have value, right? Because at least if you had the Rolodex from your last company, at least you knew who to call, right? And other people didn't know who to call. But I think today, yeah, with it was, uh, it, was know, a like point, it was a point of entry, but it, it yes. would, that was about it. Yeah, you still had to go form the relationship with the people that were really involved with it. And the point you made earlier, it was a human to human business. All right. Well, Gunnar, thank you very much. Um Tell folks how they can find out more about G2 Crowd or connect with you. Yeah, so I think um, you know, to learn more about G2 Crowd, you just go to g2crowd.com and it is a great resource for free that hopefully you all will find helpful in picking the right business software. And yeah, I think if you want to connect me with me, I think LinkedIn is a great way to do it. And I do, I am very open to what I will call random networking. So, you know, I think if you ping me on LinkedIn and, and I would just say make the message authentic and personalized, then uh, we can get connected that way. Excellent. Well, again, thank you very much for for participating in the show today. And friends, thank you for spending this time with me today. Really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule. So until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone.